So today, I've got Charlie Robinson on the programme. Hi. Hi, Vic. How are you? I'm very right. well. It's been a while, is not it? It has. It has. Okay, Charlie, so traditional first question is, what do you do? What do I do? I am, uh, well, I am a guitar technician, and I have my own guitar tech business, and I am... A lead guitarist in a heavy rock band called Black Light Vice, and that's what I do. Cool, oh, it's cool stuff. So, I'd like, I always like to sort of go back to sort of early days about how people get involved in things, um, because I think it's it's nice to sort of hear the the story of how things sort of develop and how people you know become sort of creative. So, what's your first um, remembrances of? being interested in music and being interested in guitar and yeah no of course so I think it goes back to when I was about I think maybe four or five years old and my father was working uh offshore and would come back a month on and a month off and he used to have I think we still have it somewhere we used to have this boombox, a double cassette boombox. And I remember this distinctly. Um, it was silver. It's very important. And, uh, yes. he, and he would come back and he would go and see his mates. You know, he hadn't seen them for a month. He'd go up to the pub, have a few pints, come back and go to bed and put on the, <clears throat> the player. I'd wake up being a child at a ridiculous hour and come in to the bedroom and hear you know, you'd have Dire Straits or you'd have Pink Floyd on there. And because it was a double cassette, he'd have one or the other or a couple of different things, you know, going on. And I just remember hearing the likes of Jimi Hendrix and the Beatles and Pink Floyd and things like that. And it would be on all night blaring out. And it was, that's a real memory I have of where music first started for me. Um, which I think I think I didn't realise this until I was a bit older, but that I think was massive subconscious um, yeah, direction. It is, it is absolutely. Yeah, I mean that is. It's funny you should say the Beatles because that is a theme that happens again and again. You know, people saying, "Oh, my brother used to," you know, "Oh, my sister played the Beatles." Um, that's my early recollections as well because my sister had uh, help. Mm. Um, and you sort of get, you know at the time it doesn't seem anything because it's just normal it's just there like you're saying it? you know with, with that it's just there it's absolutely just there but it's sort of it's part of the you know like the the surroundings that you're in the ecosystem if you like um, and it, as you say it sort of seeps in doesn't it yeah, yeah, and it, um, it, but that's like a memory, a locked in mm. memory that I have. Yeah. I can't. Mm. It's not very long. It's not really very long. It's like a, no. it's like an image actually, rather than a video in my head. It's an yeah, image, yeah, yeah. and it's of those sounds. That's mm. what I. That's what I remember from that. From from you know getting into music. I think that was where it started. Yeah. But but for like guitar, for example, that. That I remember, I actually really remember this, and this is probably one of my earliest memories. We were on holiday in Spain, and my my godmother's husband was Spanish, and so we used to go on holiday to visit them and go away with them, and we would go and stay in these really non-touristy, proper Spanish towns and villages, and rent a villa or something, and went into one of the local towns one day. But you've got to bear in mind, these are all, this was in the 90s, and they're all mm. Spanish speaking people. And mm. I just remember walking walking through this town, very small, like so small, where I'm looking up at everything. That's what I can see. And um, we come across this flamenco guitar shop. And 
I don't remember this, but this is what I've been told by my parents. I ran straight up to the window. I was like pointing at the window at this thing. I was like, what's that? What's that? What's that? And I remember seeing this shape. It was it was a flamenco guitar. And uh, mm-hmm. I was like, I want, I want that. I want that. I want that. And um, my mum was like, oh, no, you know, you know, you don't want that. You know, and my dad was like, no, he really is showing an interest. So then bought it for me. And that was that was when that started because I was obsessed with this thing. And bearing in mind, I was very small, like I was maybe four or five, maybe six, and a flamenco guitar neck and the flamenco guitar in general, massive, massively too big for me. But I just was like mesmerized by this thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting, isn't it? Um, cool. So what happens then? Just sort of the flamenco guitar is hanging around the house, is it? Can you yeah, it's, it's, it's there. It's always there. And uh, it's always there. And I was, I would, uh, this is quite funny, actually. I would, listening to my dad's records and on the cassette and stuff, uh, I was shocked to discover that standing in front of a mirror and pretending to play doesn't mean you can play. And this was no. quite upset. <laughs> it's quite upsetting for me. I remember thinking, oh, why can't I do that? Yeah, I think it was all along the Watchtower solo or something. Which is still one of my favourite songs of all time, <laughs> and I just remember yeah, hearing yeah, yeah. it and thinking, oh, "I want to do that, I want to do that," and uh, but I couldn't, and uh, that's when I thought, mm. "Okay, well, I actually have to, I actually have to learn to do this." You know, I thought it would just happen. Yeah, but I tell you what, standing in front of a mirror with a guitar is a recurring theme. Or know, tennis racket. Yeah, or plastic guitar. Mm. Um, lots of very famous guitar players that I've interviewed. They've all said the same thing that I did that. Uh, so I think there is, again, it's like the, the land is being sort of prepped, isn't it? Interesting, isn't it? Okay, so, right. So we've got this. You've got, you you realise that you can't just play like Hendrix. Um, yeah. <laughs> Sad, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So when did you really start to, you know, get st- stuck into playing? Well... I think I really got stuck into playing was when I met you, Vic. So I had played for, for through my, throughout my primary school life, but it only, I only got so far. And then mm. I started getting into, you know, I'd have been, you know, year six. So just about to start sort of secondary. And I was learning things and listening to things and seeing things like ACDC. And I was seeing things like Eric Clapton more and Jeff Beck and, you know, get kind of going through my mum and dad's record collections and CD collections. They had towers of CDs and they had mm. loads of stuff. There was Eric Clapton, there was the Yardbirds, there was all kinds of stuff. And uh, mm. I was just interested. I wanted more. And what I was learning at the time was, you know, chords and chord progressions and songs, but I was, now moving towards i want to learn guitar solos i want to play that yeah. you know i want to see that and then a little film called school of rock came out yeah which, yeah, yeah. which being at the level i was then it was just at the right time that film because that opened a whole thing for me i remember watching it i had a had a portable dvd player and i would watch it again and again and again and i would listen to all the songs and the music and, and jack black was like the coolest person and you know, they then start to learn about different guitar brands. You know, oh, what's that? Or you look it up, oh, it's a Gibson SG, or it's a Les Paul, it's a Flying V. And you think, hmm. And then there was a part in the film, which, which, is, <laughs> which is actually a big thing, is he's written all the bands in different areas on the board, on the, on the chalkboard. And I paused that and I wrote them all down. And I started going through them. And that's when I opened up to this massive ACDC thing. And a friend of mine at school, I, was, I must have been 13, he went, oh, that's um, because he had older brothers, you see. I don't have like older brothers. And he had two older brothers and they were into all like Metallica and ACDC and, and Nirvana. And he went, oh, that's Back in Black, um, that song. That's ACDC, Back in Black. And I went, oh, okay, so what we did, which I think is missed now with a lot of kids, is my mum took me to um, HMV. And I got a nice good three for twenty pound deal back then, and I didn't know what album it was on, so I just bought the the Donington Live at Donington album, and I just listened to it nonstop for years, 
And that was it. That was me sold. Mm. And that's what happened. Mm. <laughs> It's, yeah, it's it's amazing. I mean, there's there are a few things which I think we've been very lucky um, not to have things on tap like you know mm. as it is now. You had to go and find things, um, and obviously, when I started, it was even worse. You know, you you really had to search for things. But again, what happened, like you're saying, once you got something, you found it. You spend a lot of time with it. Yeah. And I think that's the thing that's, that really, I think that's problematic that that doesn't happen now. Yeah, because um, it's, um, it's not instant gratification. You have to really, exactly. you have to really invest in something and want to find out about it rather than you going, do. oh, I'll just search for it, you know. It's yeah. Then, it's no, that's, that's, abs- that's absolutely right. And then, of course, once you, once you've got that, because it, what happens when, when there's not a lot of, well, this is what I see anyway, and, you know, I could be wrong. Um, but I think what happens is when there's a limit to what you, you've got access to, you have to find it in yourself somehow. Yeah. So you might be learning something by somebody else, but y- it's your take on it. Yeah. Um, when everything is literally laid out in front of you, and you can, you know, all the notes are there. I think you can get quite sort of despondent about the fact that you're not going to be as good as the things written down. Whereas, of course, if, if it's an experiment, you've got to discover things. You, there's another thing that's motivating, isn't it? That sort of obsessional, like you're saying, you listen to things over and over again, and it becomes like you're part of that. It, well, it, it was your... getting to a point with this ACDC album where I could put it on and I could tell you what song it was by the crowd before it started. Yes, yes. Now, that's that's amazing, because I used to do something similar to that, where I could put a record on, and I could hear the sound <coughs> of the needle, and I sort of knew what the next track was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I could tell by the whistling of the crowd, or there was a certain scream, or there was just a certain frequency, and I was like, "It's that song, it's that song, it's that song," and I could do it like that, even on shuffle. It's quite a talent. <laughs> yeah, it is. But of course, it, that is 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 showing you how good your ear is. Mm. And okay, you would go, "But well, that's not actually to do with music." But no, no, it is sort of because it's the same thing, isn't it? Being able to recognise. Mm. And I, also the other thing, that could, and you could probably do this as well, actually, because of what you're saying, somebody could play me a clip, like two or three seconds of a, of a band, and I'd know who they were, yeah, even, yeah, yeah. Not, even if I'd never heard the song before. Well, yeah, well, my, my wife is, uh, is a talent at this. We'll do it in the car. She'll go um, put the radio on its heart. It's her best station. And uh, she go, I can name every song, but with the first few seconds. And every time, it, every single time, she gets it right. And I think you're right. It's just that, you know, you, if you're that, incli- that way inclined about music and you listen to things yeah. and you take it in yeah. and you're, and you're yeah. into it, then you will be able to do that. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And, and again, that is, that is a musical skill, you know. So if you know if you can recognise a clip of something or a character of sound of, play, of somebody's playing, and you just know within a few notes that's this guitar player or whatever. Well, that's exactly but, it with guitar players, isn't it? You can be like, oh, well, who's what track is that or what song? Who is that? If you hear listen to it in a bar, and then with a, within a few moments, you can go, oh, well, that's Slash or that's you know, yeah, yeah, because it's just yeah, you, you just, just know, yeah, exactly, absolutely, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so you get into playing. Let's, yeah. let's get a little bit because there's a lot of interesting stuff here actually um how long do you think it took you before i'll, I'll get you to answer this you know where you, you it starts to take shape for you really where you start to go oh oh my goodness yeah 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 um uh, i can't really think of a specific moment but i can think of like an area of when it sort of happened um it was when i did my first ever grade guitar so when i had this started having lessons with you so i remember you saying 
But if you want to play like that, then you need to check these guys out. And it was the Three Kings, which I still listen to now. And you were like, you need to listen to this because it's not always about all the the fast stuff. It's about where that comes from. And I've never forgotten that. And Mm. then it was, this is a, this is a grade book. These are scales and we're going to learn them. And we did. And that was when I started to do it. And I started to pick, like this is going, becoming from just playing chords to being a bit more advanced to what I was hearing on CD and thinking, actually, I'm starting to be able to do this now. So it was doing these scales and thinking, actually, that sounds like a solo. It was all about guitar soloing and wanting to do that for me Mm. and listening to those guys, the, the three kings. I was just like, yeah, I can do that you know, to start with, with these scales, and then it will progress, and it did. And that's that was my kind of moment where I was like, I can do this. I can do what they're doing. Yeah, yeah. Because there's a fundamental thing, really, about the blues, which feeds in. And it's not just blues, because you could say that's that's true with, you know, the way that rock and roll f- filters into things. But those, the, the, three, the three kings, as I used to call them, me and the BB King and Albert King and Freddie King, there's so many guitar players were inspired by them that their their guitar phrases you can find them in most really great players. Yeah, and of course it's like learning to speak. It's like learning to 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 speak that language, and of course once you've got how that works, and particularly if you've got a player. He doesn't really play an awful lot of notes. I mean, Freddie King's a really good example of this, where, you know, a solo could be four notes. Yeah. Just the, those four notes over and over again in different sort of permutations. And you think, okay, if I could nail that with those four notes. Yeah. And I can play 24 bars with four notes. You know, anything that you can add to that, if you can keep that ability to, to keep being able to rephrase and re- reinvent something, uh, it's, then it's you're on a winner. And it's also songs like, um, you know, Little Red Rooster, for example. Yeah. Just a simple blues, three quarter. And when you're learning, when you first pick up a guitar and you think, I can't do this. If you can just learn that, the, the sense of empowerment you have is amazing because you're like, I can actually play yeah. something that's in time that everyone recognizes. And then when you start looking at scales, it's a really easy platform to learn over. And now with the tech we have now, you could record yourself on your phone playing this, you know, little red rooster, E, D, A, or whatever it might be. And then you can just solo over it and try. And now it's a, it's a lot easier to actually feel accomplished immediately, which then inspires you. You know, it, exactly. it doesn't have it's to all be, about inspiring, isn't it? Yeah, it, and it doesn't have to be like, oh, I, oh, I want to learn, I want to learn the one solo from you know Metallica. It's like, well, you know, yeah, one day, but you got to start, <laughs> got to start back here first, and actually appreciate what you have done. Absolutely, definitely. Um, okay, so yeah, it's interesting because you, you know, there's a few things obviously I know about. How things sort of develop, but um, there's never a, this something I really want to sort of bring out in this conversation is that de- when you develop as a player, it's not just a straight line where you get these little incremental things going on. It's like you go along and it, it's like you get stuck, and then suddenly you make this massive jump. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I call it the stairs. I talk about this all the time to lots of people. It for, and I've noticed this myself over being a guitar player for however many years I've been one. You will be going along like this for ages, and then all of a sudden you'll go, Poof, and then it will go along again, exactly. and then it'll yeah. go whoop, like this, and it'll just keep going up like that in stairs. And it's stairs. Yeah, exactly. I say, I say it to lots of people. It's all about the stairs. And one day it could be, could be like a year. It could go up a few times, or it could be five years, yeah. and it won't move. And then one day, yes, exactly. It'll go up. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But it's not a straight line. That's Never. the thing. 
you know, it's never that sort of, you know, a percentage increase each time, which is logically what we think would happen if you, you practice, but it's not like that. And the other thing I think is interesting, like you've already said about the, the blue, you know, the, the, the blues players that you were listening to, certain things initiate massive change. And sometimes those things are really small. Mm-hmm. They're just something that you wouldn't even think that that would have that impact, but it can transform the way you play and transform the way you see music and, and experience music and all the rest of it. And I think you had a couple of those in that period of time when you, you yeah, where you, you suddenly changed, you know, um, and uh, I, I don't know if you remember them that way or not. Yeah, I do. I remember a specific one. Um, so once we had done the three kings learning you know from going through some of the grades from like grade two I started and we started moving through the grades I was you were opening me up to more music I was then getting into bands and starting to kind of play with people then you bounce off one of them like that but then you start I, I well there's a moment where I listened to Appetite for Destruction for the first time so I had um, my ACDC obsession for like five years. And then I was 15. I remember this clear as day. I was 15. I thought, you know what? I want to go and listen to something else. I want to see if I can see something else. So I went downstairs to my mum and dad's CD collection. And I just pulled out randomly just CD covers that I thought looked cool. I had no idea. And I remember pulling out, I think it was... Iron Butterfly, Moody Blues, and Appetite for Destruction. And I thought, that one looks cool. So I put that in, and then Welcome to the Jungle, the intro of Welcome to the Jungle started, and that literally changed my life forever. Even now, it's my favourite song, and my favourite band, Slash is my favourite guitar player, and that's when that happened. That's a notable time there, because I was like, who is this? What is this? And all these fireworks started going off in my head. And I had to know, I had to learn it. I had to watch it. I had to, so I did all this stuff. And that's when mm. I was like, I need to learn that riff. I need to do this. And I worked hard at that. But all the while, learning the grades and the scales and all those things and progressing through, I started to find an identity, right, mm. as a guitar player. So I had all these things that I knew of, but I started to kind of narrow it down to what I wanted mm. to be and the players I really kind of gravitated to. So yeah, mm. that was a point when that happened for sure. Mm. When it, my mm. level went up like on another shelf. Mm. It's interesting that, isn't it? Because again, sometimes you can come across a player that you could almost you would have ignored earlier. I'm not necessarily so necessarily saying that would have been the case with Slash, but you can come back to a player that you didn't you weren't ready for. And maybe, in a strange sort of way, you weren't ready for that earlier. Yeah, no. Because there's a, you know, because, and I think this is true with people like Brian May, actually. I think you need to know a little bit more about playing before you realise how good a player like Brian May is. I think Um, that way about Keith Richards. uh, Yes, yes, yes. That's so absolutely. It's only yeah, until yeah. like actually about three years ago, I really sort of. And that's even now, right? Three years ago, when I sort of clicked on, I was like, "Keith Richards has got something going on here," you know. Yeah. He had something going on here, but at the time, growing up, I was like, "Oh, flashy guitar solos and all this stuff." But actually, you listen to Keith Richards playing some of those solos and some of those riffs in the Stones, and you think, "Wow, that's." That's really clever, actually. Maybe two, three notes, four notes, but it's clever and it's really, really atmospheric. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's something otherworldly about Keith. <laughs> That's the best <laughs> way to put it. Is that an understatement um, or what? Yeah, no, it is an understatement. Um, because obviously, the, the thing about the Stones, you know, because I, I, I had sort of my teenage years in Dartford, and of course, wherever you went, you know, when you started playing, 
if you went into, into a pub or something like that, the Stones had played there, whether they had or not. But that was part it's, of the, it's you know, part of the aura you know, of it. Yeah, yeah. There's somebody said, "Oh, the Stones used to play that," you know, um, and and it, it possibly did. I don't know, you know, because they would have played. They would have played around that that area before they went to London. Um, so they were always there. Um, didn't matter what style of music you were doing, they were sort of haunting, haunting you somehow because there was something about how they put things together because it was almost like they were inventing it. Yeah, as um, it was happening. Although, yeah, because, okay, they were influenced by you know, Motown and R&B and all the rest of it. But the point is they were doing it their way. Because, again, you had to work it out off the record, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you had to do your own thing on it because you couldn't always get it right. And you can see that in that way that he, he plays. It's just immediately, it's got the vibe, it's got the soul of whatever it is he's doing. He just manages to put that across so eloquently. It's effortless for him. It is. It is. Um, and some of the some of the ideas are so simple. Um, but you know, and so, and sometimes sort of slightly counterintuitive. Uh, obviously, satisfaction, I think, is a good example of that. Yeah. How that, that works. And and the other one I would say um, is miss you. Mm. Huh? Because that guitar phrase is, is sort of slightly upside down somehow. It's like, uh, it, for, well, for the time, it seems a bit really out there. Yeah, oh, well, I mean, really, because what it was... Different. Because it, it, it was a disco song, really. Mm. But it wasn't a disco song, if you see what I mean. <laughs> Which is, I think, quite typical of the Stones. Because you listen to their stuff and you go, OK, you, you mentioned Little Red Rooster, and that is obviously totally blues but it yeah. and it to the point that it's even playing with the form you know like a lot of the blues players did it wouldn't necessarily be a 12 bar you know it could no. be anything um it's the one where you're in a place and you go and there's, oh, there's a couple of musicians there there's a drummer a couple of guitar players two bass players a singer and a banjo player and you go right we're going to do little red rooster and it all works out every time because it's that it's that simple yeah. track that you can just yeah. do whatever you want with, and you could and, and the thing is you can sit on that riff for as long as you want. Yeah, and then and all we got to do is look at each other. Exactly, and then you look at each other. Yeah, exactly. And I always find that I, in fact, I use that as an example when I talk about songwriting, particularly about how it doesn't have to follow a form. You know, no. you know, it doesn't have to change when you think it's going to change. And a lot of, a lot of those muddy waters type um, ideas. Where uh, there's a really great song version of uh, "Rock Me Baby" by Muddy Waters. And if you, of course, if you listen to the original BB King version, which I know you, you know well, he sings on the he sings on the one chord, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, rock me baby. But, when Muddy Waters does it, he sings on the four chord. Yeah. So he doesn't play over the one. He waits to the four and then he sings. And of course, Little Red Rooster does that. The riff is on the, the, the one and it goes to the four and he, he starts singing. And it's like how you change, turn the, the form upside down. Uh, the other good example of, 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 a, of a song that breaks those sort of conventions about what we think a good song does or how you play blues, you know, is uh, Manish Boy. It's, yeah. it's just one yeah, riff yeah. and it doesn't go anywhere. And yet it's like a it's like a it's like a steamroller, you know? Um, it's incredible. And you think, how how does that happen? Yeah. You, even you listen to it and you think But but you think that, but then you just accept it. Of <laughs> course you do, because it's just so incredible. You can't, yeah, you, yeah. can't you know. So anyway. Yeah. So we're getting a bit anarchy, but this is good because this is the sort of thing I think, you know, when you, you know you play an instrument, you start to really get into how things work. And, and I think this is interesting because, as you say, you, you, you're a guitar tech 
as well. And in a way, it's about how the guitar works, you know, that concept, not just how a song works. But... Well, that opens up another book, doesn't it? It when does. When you start to learn about that side of it, it, you, it actually not only adjusts your playing, but it really fully, fully invests you in that instrument like you wouldn't believe because you then know your instrument inside and out rather than just the strings. Like yeah. it, it, it becomes a different thing, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I would say that's the same about being able to write songs. Makes you understand how songs obviously work. So when you yeah. learn a song by somebody else, you're fully invested in somebody else's song because you can see things in that song that you wouldn't normally see if you just learnt it. Yeah, but and it I, makes you listen to music differently. It does, uh, totally. Totally does, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, when you... Because you had a, some interesting bands that you, you worked with quite early on, didn't you? Um, and uh, you managed to get the sort of... the rock guitar persona really well, I thought. <laughs> Thanks, Rick. <laughs> well, you Thank did. You. you did, totally. Um, because you, you, your hair is a lot shorter than it was, I must say. Yeah, um, it's a lot shorter now. It's uh, still curly. Still curly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you, you certainly had the um, image. Um, so, so tell me, when, when, start, when did things really start to kick off? Because you had some really, you did some really great gigs, didn't you? Did some great stuff, yeah. So, I mean, where do you want to start? I mean, we could start at the bit where, uh, we created an ACDC tribute band and that was my first ever gig and we learned every song off Donington CD because we were all obsessed with it yeah. and uh, and it was great because a friend of mine his brother um, he he didn't play guitar but his mum wanted him involved with it and somehow so uh, so uh, we we got him to get a bass I said right well well, well this is what you need to do in an ACDC band you just put play the root note and then every now and then move it up to the octave root note and then back down again and just make sure that you're in time with the drums. Okay. And he's like, yeah, yeah. And it was great. And you know what? It was, it worked really well, but that was this yeah. ACDC tribute band, which we did a couple of gigs. And then that's when I think we started to all find our feet a bit, yeah. you know, getting up there for the first time yeah. with a band of your own. Like we did yeah. with Vic where I'd come, come to a gig of yours and get up and play, a bit of or like pork pie hat or something and we'd get up and do a bit and then and then that was like my introduction to playing on stage which i tell you is a daunting experience but it's you need to do it yes because i've got i've got something happening on sunday actually where i've got loads of kids playing um which of course is almost like dealing with a runaway horse um because you know there's so many kids playing there's, there's nothing i can do if it <laughs> to go out but um yeah so that's on sunday so i'm still doing that type of thing where you get because it needs that to happen for, yeah of course it is because once you get that first experience of standing in front of people playing even if they can't hear you it doesn't actually matter no but you know it's it was just... for me vic i remember playing that little club in maidstone little it was quite a dingy club and, yes uh, I remember the Jazz and Soul, there. it was at, well, the yeah. Jazz and Soul Cafe, wasn't it? I remember getting up there and I was really nervous and I got on there and do you know what? I came off that stage and I just wanted to go again. And ever since it's... then, every single time I've gone on stage ever, yeah. I've been excited. I've never really been nervous. I've been like, I'm built for this and I'm going to go and do it. You know, mm. you, you get like a a buzz. That's it, it's the buzz. Yeah, it is. And, and I think that's one of the... That's the thing I realised quite early on, that once people had done it the once, that's how it all starts. Yeah, and, that's um, exactly what happened. T totally. And, and it could literally be somebody just playing very simple chords for something. You, you know, it used to, didn't matter. And then the next time they come up, they play a little bit of lead as well. Yeah. And, and, and of course, it's like you're sort of spoon feeding people into that's and exactly in, in the end, you know, you can get a situation where I don't even have to play because they could do all the do all of it. But like, if you for... think about it, if you think of it this way, like with all the different bands I've, I've been in and stuff, if you think about that that gig that we did was 
probably like what 2004 oh I think like that. yeah it was another life 2004 2005 then you jump forward to 2011 and i'm in a band a rock band and i'm in lithuania playing an, like an i think it was like a 10,000 capacity biker festival if you think about it the scale in time isn't much actually no, no. you know and no. then you think that little first performance to then doing that. That's right. So this is what I mean. Again, again, we, the whole point about this podcast is about creativity. And okay, I'm not just interviewing musicians. I'm interviewing all sorts of people. Yeah. But intellectually, we always think because we're, you know, the way that the education system works is that you've got this very logical, schematic way of doing stuff. And life isn't like that at all. And particularly art is most definitely not not like that. Lots of things are completely and utterly illogical. Um, You would never get playing in 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 a band if you looked at the statistical evidence about how many bands make it. And obviously you wouldn't even start. It'd be pointless, you know. Yeah. you might as well just do the lottery. I mean, it's just it's just rubbish. But of course, people, you have to be illogical. You have to forget about what's reasonable. Be unreasonable. And think, okay, let's do this thing. Enjoy yourself. And don't, you know, you're aspiring to do things. And I mean, that's true with sport as as, as much as it is to do with music. But you know, and, it's all about escapism yeah you know people, in a way you people could look want to be way. in a band and they're like i want to do that i want to be like my heroes and actually i have the ability to play and i know i'm going to get like-minded people together with me and it doesn't matter what happens i just want to escape to that for a while yeah i, I mean in a way that's that is Ill, it's sort of illogical because you could actually go i just want to play I think I'm really good, but everybody else can think that you're not. But it still doesn't matter because the bands that sort of started and they weren't very good, you could, you know, the Beatles, obviously, because when they started, they couldn't play. Nirvana is another good example. They obviously couldn't play when they started. And loads loads of bands couldn't really play. I mean, probably the Stones couldn't play. You know, they were just because they were finding their feet and yeah. and interestingly that seems to work even better than you know that sort of thing that you're learning right from the beginning together yeah um and again that's like just making a load of noise D- yeah and and it really doesn't matter well, dave Grohl said like, it best didn't he he said yeah. um you were about talking about i think one of these silly programs or whatever yeah yeah um, yeah yeah. he said um you know today kids believe that they have to line up in a line for hours and hours and hours and then go and stand in front of a panel of four whoever who are you and then sing their heart out or play their heart out and then to be told that they're rubbish and it's like no he said you get you know, you get your guitar, you get a drum kit, a beaten up drum kit, and you get a bass and you go into your mum's garage and you just make a load of noise and you do that again and again and again. And then one day you will become Nirvana. Yeah, exactly. And it's true. It is absolutely true. And I mean, I remember when I was, God, how old was I? 14, 15? No, not even as old as that. 13, 14. And where I was in Dartford, there was a village hall in the in the road, St Albans Village Hall, and there was a band practicing in there. And the drummer didn't have a drum kit; he had a load of cardboard boxes, and they sounded brilliant. And he was yeah. playing on cardboard boxes, right? Amazing. Um, and you think that's the type of tenacity to learn to play. With, use what you got. People. You use what you've got. And that's true also with what you can actually do. You you use what you've got, whether that's three chords, you know, playing up and down one string. You just use what you got. And I mean, 
I've, I suppose I've got to the point now. Well, you know me, I, I know as much theory as anybody can, you know. <laughs> but really, at the end of the day, it's not about any of that. You know, I could, I could theorise with as many classical musicians about whatever in different musical style. I could do it all. But to be honest, it's got nothing to do with any of that. No. Um, and it's just, you know, if you can play a note and it sounds right, and if you can play something that you can hum back to yourself, you've got a musical idea. Yeah. And it literally is as simple as that. And just people could just get, it's, you know, and you can do this with any form of art. You know, as soon as you start to draw, as soon as you put a mark on a piece of paper, so it's a form of art. Well, that's it. But, you know, it doesn't have to look like anything. It could be anything. But it's a case of what, again, what you said, you said you, you invest yourself in that, whatever that is that you're doing. Yeah. I think that's really important. So this playing this gig in front of, 10,000 yeah. 10, people in Lithuania. Let's go back to that because this <laughs> okay. is because this this was really cool. Um, because I mean that, that sort of came out of nowhere from what I can remember. Yeah, it did. Yeah, so um, we had <laughs> it's quite funny. We had played, we were playing around Tunbridge Wells and the Forum and all you know and around there and all these places for but ages, um, quite often, which isn't always the best thing to do. Um, but that said, so we were doing that and playing to our friends and family like you do. And then as my dad actually was working away and one of his co-workers, this is, remember, this is like in the middle of the Indian Ocean or something, right? Yes. <laughs> so yes. they're in the middle of the Indian Ocean and... Um, you have to say what it is that your dad did. Well, my dad was, uh, he worked offshore on oil rigs and uh, yeah. was an operations, you know, installation, offshore installation manager. So yeah, he was yeah. in charge of, of the of the rig. And um, so his crew were there. And one of his, his crew was a chap who was part of the Lithuanian Harley Davidson group or charter or whatever you want to call it. Um, and they were talking about, about music and stuff and we had just recorded some songs and they were like oh you know we've got these we've got these bands from like poland and we've got them from finland and we've got all these but we want a uk band you know and he went oh well my son's in a a uk rock band have a listen so he got me to send the tracks over and they were like yeah this is great this is great so you know it just goes to show that opportunities everywhere yes all right and this is in the middle of the sea Okay. Yes. In yeah, in the Indian Ocean, it's not isn't even if he's in the North Sea. No, absolutely. Exactly. So it's opportunities everywhere. You just got to be in the right place at the right time. And uh, so that happened. And he was like, "Yeah, yeah, sure, that sounds great." So we, we you know, sp spoke to them, came to an agreement, a contract, and then <laughs> there's us, this little little band of eighteen year olds. One of them was still sixteen, and he was still at school, and he had to ask his. Um, this is not Ryan, is it? It is Ryan. Yeah, he had to yeah, ask. Yeah, 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 yeah. He had to ask his. He went into. It's so funny. He goes into his form tutor, and his form tutor, still good friends with him now, uh, Dave. I'll give him a shout out. And uh, he he uh, followed all the bands we were in, like he even still anyway he uh, was his form tutor and he goes and he goes oh sir i'm not going to be uh i'm not going to be in next week he goes what do you mean you're not gonna be in next week or something like that you know there's uh you know something's going on no, we've got school and stuff or whatever it was i don't know exactly but um he goes oh yeah i'm going off to lithuania with my band to play in front of x amount of people at this bike festival and this was us a little band of basically teenagers mm -hmm. who had been playing at you know the piss and whistle the week before and now we're doing this it was all you know flown out there it was all paid for at this we had a presidential suite in this hotel and it was mind-blowing <laughs> and uh and, and it was all like we had two tour vans and an entourage of people doing stuff for us and it was literally like wow like, this is amazing you know didn't have to play for half an hour didn't have to have a curfew uh, you know all of this stuff and we just turned up we're driven around all over like you know Lithuania to all these different places and that was like you you kind of like a make it moment almost yeah like, yeah yeah what's yeah. going on around me and um yeah. and that was an amazing experience and then you come back after that and then you're back to reality again do you know there's 
I was talking to, um, I was interviewing a guy who was in, in a, um, one of the, well, sort of the Medway bands, but they were actually a Maidstone band, but they were saying that they had a, a thing where they went on tour in Belgium. Right. It was like that. Um, and because they were of a certain style, you know, it was this sort of, Medway sort of punky rock bands type of thing, which were quite big over there because of people like the Milkshakes and, and you know, Billy Childish's bands and whatever. Um, because of that, they had this, you know, there was this music scene over there. Very similar thing where they, they were on TV and everything. And then suddenly <laughs> they're back in Kent again, you know, yeah. back in Mainstone and like nobody knew them. Um, and I, I, uh, there was another band. Something similar happened where they were actually they were actually got into the Belgian charts, and wow. they got picked up, <laughs> at fl- you know, flown over, um, got off the you know, picked up by a limo and all this. We went to the, t- did their thing, got back in the limo, came back, <laughs> and there was, <laughs> you know, it was their mum and dad who picked them up at the, <laughs> you know, back in England, whereas of course yeah. they were picked up by a limo. In bizarre, um, isn't it? It, yeah, it's totally bizarre. Um, and and you, you realise that all of this is just sort of, sort of, I won't say it's nonsense, but you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. Well, we were just felt like we were floating along. Like, that's the best way I can describe it. Like, you just sort of felt like you were floating along because you were like, it, it was just, a, uh, I don't know, I can't even explain it. It was just like one of those things where it's like a, you're just sort of picked up and plonked down <laughs> and then you're picked up again and plonked back down. So yeah, just yeah, before, yeah. just what, just as you're sort of getting used to this, it's over. Yes. You know? Yes. Which is probably a good thing. Actually, yeah. In a way. Um, yeah, it's good. So that, that was, that was brilliant, brilliant uh, story. Fantastic. So t- tell me, cause you had a little bit of time out from sort of playing, didn't you? You, you went off and did some, some something else uh, yeah. for a period of time, um, and then what happened? That you sort of decided, well, time to sort of come back into the sort of. Yeah, I mean, I won't go into too much detail about about it, but um, I basically went into the military and I got injured and um, had to leave on a on a medical grounds basis, mm. and putting all my time and focus into that um you know i didn't really do much music i was still listening to music and i was still playing in you know my band then burn marilyn um just we were doing on and off stuff and gigs which was good but that wasn't where my main focus was at the time for obvious reasons but then when i ha- when i left i had to come back out i was like right i'm going to go and do this again because it's something I'm really passionate about and it's something that I know I can do, Mm. you know, it's a skill that's never left me and I missed Mm. it. I missed Mm. playing my guitars, you know, did you feel that when you came back to it, you were better? Yeah, actually in a way, sort of, um, it was a bit funny for the first couple of weeks getting Mm. back into playing, but then I found, you know, you get to build up the calluses again, basically in whatever metaphor of the word there physical and metaphoric and then you start to then i started to feel i started to get all my old influences back out again so like you know pantera and and i made and i started listening to all that again and just playing and i just sort of slotted straight back into it but yeah there was definitely like a a technique change i found i found i could yeah play yeah this is what i'm saying that sometimes when you 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 come away from something because I get periods of time, I'm not really doing anything musically. I'm obviously thinking about music all the time because obviously I'm teaching. And then I come back to things and and somehow something else has changed in the way I do things. And, yeah. and again, I don't know what it is, I, but sometimes it's good to break patterns, you know, move or come away from something that you've done and sort of interested in that, you know, whether it's some sort of maturity in some, uh, you know, in some sort of way or some I sort think of... it's, you're picking up where you left off, but you're like, right, this time, yeah, 
I said subconscious thought. This is not a conscious thing. It's a subconscious. No, 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 no. I, I, am, that, yeah. I am going to be better at this yeah. than I was, and I'm going to improve. Mm. And I think that does happen. And I, and I think I had a clear vision. I was sort of sitting there thinking, I'm going to start a band. I'm going to advertise. And this time, I'm not just going to get my friends in who can play guitar or play a bass or someone that I know. I'm going to be very, very specific in what I'm looking for. Mm. And I'm going to find these people who want to do this on musical grounds. I don't know them. You know, I want to meet them through the music. And that definitely was a different way of looking at things because i've never done that before i've never gone i've never gone into bands with people that i didn't really know or know of or who weren't friends before yeah so this was like completely everyone in the band now that i'm in that how that all came together yeah because of coming together for the music they didn't know each other yeah 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 so because you, 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 you're saying about doing the guitar tech stuff, right? Um, when did you? Because you, you're doing a lot of this now, aren't you? Sort of yeah, setting up yeah. guitars. And... So that that happened just before lockdown. I set up this thing just before, and then it lockdown happened and all that, which was wasn't the best thing, but also it kind of was because all these people like started flooding in when it was when we were able to go out and things people were flooding into my inbox um because they had picked up their old guitars at the back of the cupboard yes and they hadn't touched for years or you know and and they wanted them set up and fixed to start playing again and that is definitely what lockdown did it it yeah. breeded a load of musicians yes because i'll tell you another little story about lockdown and, and to do with this um i was talking to jason howell of okay. road sound and he said yeah. they sold far more streams in lockdown yeah, um sure. and and it's like yeah you know people are like well i can do this i've got time i've got, got, time. Time to do I've got the time yeah yeah, that's yeah, the yeah. Thing. yeah yeah so i thought that was an, that is interesting so that sort of corroborates what you're saying really isn't it so you do that and so where are you now you're down in i'm Portsmouth? in uh, i'm in southampton southampton right. yeah on the south coast Still. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, okay. So now you got. Uh, what's the, what's the, what's your band's name now? My band is called Black Light Vice. So that's Black mm. Light Vice, um, and it's a heavy, heavy hard rock band from Southampton. And uh, yeah, we've been we've been going. Well, that was in 2019. Then back end of that, and then COVID, obviously not it just disrupted the, the progress but we had a lot of time planning but yeah that's that's really only come around well out to the public it really in the last last year eight eight nine months um but yeah that's been going pretty well yeah okay yeah so what sort of what sort of things are you doing gig wise um you, well we're, we're just basically doing... we're gigging around sort of southampton and surrounding that's our kind of thing you know, it's Southampton's great for music. The music scene down here is amazing. And there's a lot of venues, a lot of, you know, venues that everyone in the country knows of as well. So it's it's a really good ground for music, especially rock and metal. But that's really coming back around and it's really pre- present here. Um, there's a lot of bands that are rock and metal based bands down here. And it's just a really great place to be musically. It's mm. almost like it's bright and a bit further across. You know, it's it's that music hub, but it's a yeah. bit more raw here. Yeah, yeah, I'd yeah, say. yeah, yeah. Oh, that's cool. It's brilliant. Cool stuff. Um, well, Charlie, that's 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 awesome, mate. It's, and it's really good to catch up with you. It's yeah, been a long while. and yeah. um, yeah, you know, I've heard some of your stuff, and it's, it's absolutely killer. <laughs> really good. Thanks, Vic. Cheers. I really appreciate it. No, really it's good. It. So, yeah, all the best with what you're doing. And I'll put some stuff on the show notes. So if you send me some links and things. Yeah, sure. I'll um, send you some links and that. And the... and then people can have a listen to what you're doing. Thanks. Yeah, no, it'd be great. And uh, thanks for having me on. Like, it's, the first no, it's, good. it's the first podcast that I've ever done. And uh, Yeah, well, there we are. So, so I've thank got you. A few people, I've also I've got a few people that I've interviewed who now do their own podcasts. Really? Interesting. Just a little thought. Interesting. I'll just, I just put that in there um, <laughs> as an idea. 
All right, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks no, for having me on. It's been a pleasure for me as well. It's great to catch up with you again. Thank All you. right. All right. Take care. Okay. Yeah. Cheers then. All the best. Bye. Bye. Thank mm-hmm. you.